Welcome back to the Hip Hop Social Worker Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Scott. And today I got a special guest. Um, you know, we connected through the uh, Black Men of Social Work group, I believe, on uh, Facebook. But his name is uh, Dante Henderson. And uh, he could tell you a little more about himself, more than I can. So uh, go ahead, brother. Great. I'm Dante Henderson. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm currently in school uh, pursuing my master's in social work. Um, I've been practicing in the field probably for about about three years uh, officially. But if you want to be very honest, I really feel like I've been doing social work all my life. Um, I started off my, off my career as a youth development uh, worker and teacher at the age of 14 years old. And I've pretty much done everything under the spectrum of uh, in education besides be a principal. I've been a counselor before. I've taught creative writing, taught paleontology and, and neuroscience, been director of a college program, uh, a clinician, and now I uh, founded the Made Man Foundation, which is uh, my latest venture. And the Made Man Foundation is dedicated to closing the opportunity gap for young black men in grades four through 12 using hip hop therapy, literacy interventions, and also experiential education as the tools for change. And, uh, we've been doing some really great work in the Chicago community uh, with helping young black men and also uh, as recently uh, uh, brown young men as well uh, change their narrative through the lens of hip hop. Um, as a hip hop head myself, um, I have known the great value that hip hop has to be uh, cross curricular and add a lot of value to uh, the already growing body of, of education. And in the clinical space, it has uh, been uh, proven and it's, it's showing more proof um, with more and more research that's coming out that it can address uh, things such as trauma uh, and other mental illnesses that uh, people go through. So I'm, um, I'm really blessed to be in this space. And uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much about me. Written a few books. Um, I don't know, man. I, I dibble and dabble in a little bit of everything, brother. Yeah, it sounds like it, man. It sounds like you've been, uh, you've been busy. You said since the age of 14. Yeah, hey, 14, man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly, uh, I just have always had a knack for working with, with youth. Um, as somebody who has, uh, you know, been around mentors all my life, you know, I didn't grow up without a father. I was raised by a single mother. My mother always made sure she put me around excellent models of men and women. Um, that I could, you know, build off of, and it's my way of giving back. And honestly, it's just, it's just, it's just in me to do it. Um, and I'm still energized by the work, and I just love the the energy of, of young people and the potential that they have. So I'm always blessed to be able to work in these spaces with uh, younger younger people. Okay, yeah, I appreciate you going into that. Could you um, maybe uh, you know go into? I mean, like like you you you. Uh, I stated a lot of stuff that you've been doing, you know what I'm saying? And but could you dig a little deeper in like, you know what I'm saying, like why, you know what I'm saying, why you you really chose um, you know, the social work path? So I, when I first got into the field of uh official, official social work, I got an opportunity to be a clinician um at this organization and predominantly I was working with uh a Latino population. Um it was cool for me just because you know the age group of the kids I was comfortable with, they were eighth graders, eighth, seventh and eighth graders at the time, and I was a clinician. And uh, I got the job uh, because the, the person who, who hired me, she saw the energy that I had around the kids. Like, I'm pretty much the teacher that, like, you know, I allow you to kind of express yourself in class. Like, I'm going to mm -hmm. hold you accountable, but I'm kind of like the cool teacher a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but she saw me at some kind of school function because uh, her husband worked there. And um, she saw the energy I had around the kids. She was just like, man, this guy has this really good instincts. Uh, so when we sat down for my interview and she explained to me what a clinician was, I'm just like, man you know what this is actually the space that I've always wanted to be in because when I first started off college I was a psychology major and I was going to Clark Atlanta University and I really just wanted to be uh, a therapist and I thought psychology was the only route that you could take to get there yeah so went from Clark from 2002 to 2004 um, then I sat out of year of school from 2004 to 2005. Then I ended up uh, uh, going to and graduating from Bradley University. And when I first got to Bradley, I was a psychology major still, but I got introduced to uh, abnormal psychology class and I just, I was falling asleep. And I was like, if I can't get through this, this is supposed to be one of the most cracking classes. Like, I'm probably not going to be a good psychologist. So 
by that time I was, you know, uh, early 20s and I just really wanted to graduate. So I ended up getting a public relations degree, but I still kept doing, you know, things in the nonprofit uh, sector, education, social work. I kept doing, uh, taking jobs like that. So the public relations degree was just really for me to get out of college. So yeah. I fast forward to the opportunity that I originally owed up the story about. Um, you know, I was a teacher and I, I was transitioning out of teaching because I was kind of in this space where I, I got tired of, you know, uh, sending kids off to college. And I didn't really feel like they were emotionally, social emotionally prepared mm-hmm. uh, to really deal with the rigors that come with, uh, you know, matriculating through school. So I was contemplating on starting a nonprofit. I had a lot of talks with my principal at the time. Everybody who knows me known uh, has known that the Made Man Foundation has been uh, a gem of mine that I've been wanting to start since middle school. Yeah. I actually got the name Made Man from the Silk the Shaka CD. <laughs> yeah, like, I know yeah. people talk <laughs> Silk the Shaka out like, a lot, bro, oh, but like, man. honestly, the game is like uh, a, a down style classic. Like, I will stand on that. Yeah. And as a as a, a teenager, I really identified with the messages that were going on in Made Man. So while I didn't necessarily have a street background, you know, c- the coming of age aspect of it, coming into your own as a young man, um, grappling with being black uh, and marginalized and just understanding what that meant for my life as a teenager and then paralleling it to uh, however Silk was at that time. Mm-hmm. I identify with that. So like at eighth grade, I came up with the acronym Made Man stands for making a difference for each man. And also to the credit of his brother, Master P, um, I thought of like, man, you know what? Like this is somebody who really embodies being independent and black owned. And that's always what I strove to be. Ever since I listened to the intro to the Ice Cream Man CD, uh, you know, I have been thoroughly inspired by Master P and his journey of just staying independent, staying down, staying true to your vision, um, investing in yourself, yeah. um, doing things the way you see fit. And so while I, I'm jumping around his story, but it just it just lets you know how life always comes back full circle. So when mm-hmm. I met this lady who put me into the uh, the clinician job, you know, I was in that space of creating Make Man. I just didn't know exactly what that looked like. Yeah. And so she she told me that I could actually become a therapist through the social work route. Like my whole background of, of knowledge about social work up to that point, like, yo, these just the people that just take your kids away from you. Like, I really didn't know exactly what social work was. I was and I was I was ignorant to to what all it could be. But when I found out that I had been practicing social work through the various spaces um, and, and, you know, uh, positions that I had, it was incumbent upon me to go deeper into the field. So um, I was a clinician at first. Um, after that, um, let me see, I created a, a, a mentoring program um, mm-hmm. at a nine to five job. And then also that summer, I also uh, put in the paperwork to found the Made Man Foundation. And um, since then, man, we've been serving uh, the city of Chicago, the suburbs of Chicago, and really, uh, you know, achieving some great outcomes with young black men. But uh, honestly, uh, it was really inspired by just the entrepreneurial spirit of No Limit Records, specifically Master P. Yeah. And uh, I got the name from Silk the Shaka. Um, you know, the the mentoring influences that I had in my life coming up as a teenager. I mean, I went through a really rough patch. I went, well, let me let me take back really rough because, you know, when I think about it in terms of what really rough means to some people, I went through a patch in, in my life and I would say seventh and eighth grade, I was you know, I was not connecting uh, with my mother. You know, I did, there was just a, you know, at, around that time, kids started listening to their peers a lot more. Um, I was, you know, becoming my own as a man, grappling with hormones. And, you know, that was kind of a pivotal moment in my life. And if I didn't have mentors to kind of step in and intercede and show me a different way, like, yo, know, like, I honestly could have got, like, a few girls pregnant at, like, in, like, eighth grade. Mm. And, you know, it was just, yeah. I just, um, I saw the, I saw where the value of being having a man uh, to kind of stand in there and to affirm what you're feeling, uh, to show you a different way, give you some tools, and to show you what your future could look look like. So any space that I've ever worked in, it has really uh, been reflective of the type of mentors that I've had growing up. So 
yeah, man, rap music, early influences with mentors. And honestly, I feel like it is honestly my life purpose uh, to really kind of work in this space. And um, I'm, um, I've am i been doing it uh, really well for about three years now. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it sounds like you got, it sounds like you got more than three years. So why like, so why put the emphasis on the three years? So when I say the, the, the emphasis of three years, like uh, <laughs> paperwork wise, we, we, okay. we've been up in foundation for three years. But the, uh, <laughs> the vision, the vision has has changed over the years because when I first started Made Man, it was going to be a boys and a girls club. Mm-hmm. Um, then I went through a whole spiritual transformation in 2009, 2010. Uh, originally, it was going to be like a, a Christian youth development organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then um, probably around 2015, early 2016, it was I was only going to be working with like third and fourth graders for like literacy. And I was going to include hip hop in there somewhere. But then when I got the clinician job, it really kind of took the shape of hip hop therapy, uh, literacy and inventions and experiential education and just being a great supplement to the social work services that go on, that go on inside of schools. Um, you know, social work looks differently inside of the school system. You know, sometimes what I've heard from social workers, you get stuck doing IEPs all day. That was never my, the life that I want to live. Yeah. And when I thought about the connections that I have with students and the, the skill set that I had, I really uh, holding space uh, for students who need to talk to somebody. Um, you know, sometimes our kids are put in very adult positions and, uh, you know, they might have to go home, take care of their siblings. They might have mm-hmm. to deal with issues that even adults don't even know how to grapple with. And you're, and you're putting these pressures and you're putting these problems on top of kids who, whose brains and hearts and minds are still developing and it's shaping their perspective of the world. And it's, uh, sometimes if, uh, you know, you don't have a safe space to really kind of deal with those things to really kind of process those things. It can distort your view of the world. Yeah. Um, it can also give you some great strengths as well, too, because, you know, a lot of uh, most of my kids are what well, all of them are. They have resiliency. Um, and it's about finding uh, the gym in that in that resilient story. Um, and I feel like rap music does, does that. So three years paperwork wise, but yeah. if you want to keep it all the way it's been it's been you know crafted over about twenty some years. So yeah, yeah. So you've been putting in that work. You know what I'm saying, yeah. uh, man. Man, that's that is definitely what's up. Yeah, because I feel like um, we like social workers. We always kind of end up here just through like you know. I was 14 when I got well, maybe 15 when I got my first you know little job in the community working with um, youth, you know, kids that were younger than me. And I feel like you just kind of, uh, you kind of hone those skills. And it's something that just followed me, you know what I'm saying, working with kids. Something that always kind of just, you know, and it's something that I feel like it's, it, it, something that, I, that I'm really good at, you know what I'm saying? Like, with no, like, I don't really have, like, any kind of, like, special tips or anything. I just think my vibe is just, you know, like, I'm not judgmental, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not super, like, um punitive you know yeah, what I'm saying? absolutely you know absolutely but you know what i'm saying like i still get the point across kids still understand you know what i'm saying like where i'm coming from and, and why what i'm saying has value you know absolutely so yeah so you said you do you do hip-hop therapy yes hip-hop you know what therapy yes that's, um, that's so, what's up yeah hip-hop therapy uh was something that i knew i wanted to include in my practice because when I was a, a teenager, I used to always put on the music to kind of soothe me. And as a, a writer, um, you know, I identify with it from a literacy aspect of it just because when I was, I knew when I was listening to the Tupac or when I was listening to Master P, that was pretty much uh, poetry just over a beat. When you really dissect the lyrics, brothers were really expressing their feelings. And I always, I mean, when I started writing, it was honestly for girls, you know, Mm -hmm. I always could rhyme a few words. I could always read better than most of the brothers in my grade level. (laughs) I hope they listen to it. (laughs) Uh, So that kind of helped out a little bit. But honestly, when I was going through some things uh, with depression and with anxiety uh, as a teenager, those, that space really helped me to process what I was feeling. And I got, when I got validation from, you know, my peers, when I got uh, from my teachers, when I was winning contests, mm. and inspired me to go deeper. And I just know that 
you know, when I, I put, I'll give you a perfect example. If you listen to Tupac's song, uh, So Many Tears, off the Me Against the World album, he's talking about a lot of different uh, mental health issues. Uh, you see paranoia, uh, you see depression, uh, you see anxiety, you see a lot of stress. Um, and you also see, you see a hope for the future. You see uh, his aspirations and you see the full spectrum of a human. And if you even uh, parallel it to, to nowadays, and I'm not comparing, uh, you know, uh, these two brothers as if they're on the same scale, but just in terms of content, uh, you know, nowadays, those messages are the NBA young boys of the world. Uh, mm-hmm. You listen to the, the Lizzie Osamas uh, from Chicago. These brothers, they are speaking about feelings yeah. and it's not necessarily cool in our in our community. Uh, to, to talk about mental health issues, but if you want to even break it down on a more micro level, amongst us as black men, it is frowned upon to talk about feelings, and we all have them. Yeah. And our feelings, uh, they manifest in behaviors. They manifest in, uh, un, uh, you know, illicit uh, sexual activity, uh, drug usage, alcohol usage, uh acts of violence. And when you don't know how to, to speak uh, your feelings, you act in ways that are non-pro-social and that are very unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, my uh, my goal with the rap music is not to necessarily say, oh yeah, futures are really, really bad for, you know, speaking about drinking lean. <laughs> no, honestly, it is to really help you to kind of to slow down and to slow that uh, that trigger response. Because sometimes, like, when you, you're not able to process what you're feeling, you can act before you think. And I feel like rap and writing uh, helps you to really slow down that, helps you become a better critical thinker, helps you to process things better. And also, too, uh, I'm working on uh, learning more about the actual uh, brain waves that are triggered when you're listening to beats, because there are certain frequencies that go off, they calm the, they calm the brain. So, no, rap ha- had to be a part of it. And um, through Made Man, uh, we really, we listen to songs. Uh, I have students, one of the first activities I do, I had them give me their playlists. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you get a student's playlist, um, you know, <laughs> That's an endearing thing. Uh, that's a connecting tool. You know, you'll find out you have a lot of commonalities with students. It helps to break the whole I'm bigger than you aspect that exists inherently within teacher student relationships. And it helps to level the playing field because I tell them I uh, I learn as much from you as I'm teaching you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, uh, rap is that the great connecting tool. So we either connecting on rap music, what type of food we like or what type of video games we playing. So either way is a win. <laughs> That's real. I know uh, when I used to work the res, um, not the res, like in like you know Indian reservation, but like you know residential facilities. Absolutely. I, I used to. Um, there was this. There was this uh, game on MySpace, and it was called like the soundtrack to your life, and it had like mm. these you know opening credits, romantic scenes, all this stuff, right? And um, I remember I did that with the youth that I worked with, and you write about the playlist because like you know the songs they choose really kind of tell you, you know what I'm saying, like their priorities, you know, or what kind of space they in. So, you know, and most people don't think about that, you know what I'm saying, like how like just the music they're listening to, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, what they're vibing out to, you know what I'm saying, if it's something that's really cracking, you know what I'm saying, then they might be a little more up, you know what I'm saying, if it's something that's really kind of thoughtful and, you know, like you said, the, um, you know, that Pac song, you know, I mean, shit, I used to bump shit like that in, um, in high school and I never really understood like why. You know what I'm saying? Like, why I was feeling like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, I like those songs, like, Shed So Many Tears and songs, you know, that was just about going through stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, and for me, I feel like hip-hop music, in, 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 in most ways, it was very harmful because it had, like, you know, like, a lot of toxic elements that I tried to live out. But in a lot of ways, it was very helpful because it had ways that I could cope, you know what I'm saying, without really having to go and show that I was hurt. Because like you said before, we couldn't do that as black men, you know what I'm saying? You know, not amongst our peers anyway. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. You know? But yeah, like, I mean, even the, even the brothers who claim they don't have feelings, uh, they have feelings. Like, when you get <laughs> mad, brother, that's a feeling. Yeah, <laughs> for real. You didn't cut somebody out, brother. You just have showed your feelings. Mm-hmm. And you might want to call it, you know, uh, you might want to call it some, uh, you know, other thing. But honestly, those are feelings. And just understanding, uh, understanding how you feel, uh, why you feel. And, you know, uh, being able to just identify the source of whatever that feeling is, that's that's tr- self-awareness at, at its heart. And I always tell brothers this, man, like the brothers that's self-aware, the brothers that's very in tune, man. Like, hey, brother, you you uh, you looking real good to the ladies, man. And mm-hmm. get in tune. Yeah. <laughs> cool, man. You, you know, me? I yeah. mean, this is a this is useful skill that's not even I mean, not even going to help you out with that. That's something that I tell the young men because that's, you know, kind of what they're thinking about these days. But. I just tell them, I mean, it helps you to work with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, people work with other people who are, you know, have great uh, SEL skills. And, you know, the more and more you get practice with that at an early age, it'll help you to solve, you know, even greater problems later on in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you had mentioned before when you was younger, you, you, uh, you had experienced anxiety and depression, right? Mm -hmm. So like, when did you kind of, uh, when were you able to come to, place where you was like like okay this is what i was going through you know like was it later on in life or was it you know what i'm saying like as you was going through it you know as i was going through it i just realized that i was always just a little uh i lived in my head you know i was the only child and just you know sometimes i was not able to uh process those type of things uh with my mother you know yeah. so you know, being an only child, uh, already kind of being introverted and just having these uh, these very large emotions that, you know, I just didn't know what to do with. Uh, my mother would always say, like, you know, if you don't uh, talk it out or if you don't have some place to put it, one day you're going to explode. Um, things really came to a head when I was in college. Um, I would say probably my sophomore year of college, I just... You know, I was probably in the best space, you know, from an external view. I was making really good grades. Uh, I was coming into my own. I mean, I was getting close to being, I think I was probably like 19, 20 or something like that. And I just hit a depression out of nowhere. You know, I started feeling suicidal. I started feeling like, you know, what is the purpose and why am I here? Um, it was just like a trickle effect. Like my brother transferred from school. That kind of affected me. Mm -hmm. I was going out with a young lady back at home. That wasn't, that wasn't kind of working out. And it was like all these ways that I felt like the world was telling me is just like, yo, like this ain't for you. Yeah. Um, so I went to a therapist and like on the very first visit, she let me know that it, uh, she, she was, she prescribed me medication. It was Trazodone. And I end up not taking the medication because I'm just like, hmm, that's crazy. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I came into the office and she like instantly gave me medication. And this is before, like, you know, nowadays they're doing, you know, uh, medicine management. They're not doing yeah. necessarily the talk therapy thing. So for her to kind of like give me something like that, like, yeah. I was just, it let me know. I was like, all right, so cool. All right. So I started, you know, really kind of getting deep into my spirituality and I started writing more around that time. And that let me know that what I was experiencing was very heavy, but there were I had to be my own medicator at that point. Um, And, you know, just through conversations with a a good friend of mine, Tamika, uh, you know, conversations with God and just honestly, uh, just really pulling myself out of through that through through writing. um, I kind of came out of my depression and I was I learned how to cope with it better. Mm -hmm. And it was I mean, that's what I'm saying. And that was like a I mean, if you want to say like I probably started noticing around like seventh grade. Yeah. and that traveled me all the way to like sophomore year of college. And I kind of like that was still something to this day that I still kind of battle with. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, but that story right there, you know, I tell that to some of our students and I, I shed it in the spaces that are, that are safe uh, because, you know, it comes out of nowhere. Um, and mm-hmm. sometimes you, it's a, it's a very hard story to tell, but it's a necessary story to tell because um, through that I found passion and I found purpose. Um, I found people. Uh, I found healing within myself. I met other healers on my path, mm. and because of that, I'm, I'm here to this day. Yeah, 
I don't know. It's something about college, man, that just really brings everything to the forefront. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> man, I don't know if it's you away from home or if you just all that, you know, you just got all that access to stuff that you probably shouldn't be having access to or I don't know. It just it's college and college really, yeah. College is I feel like a lot of people's story have like, you know, like, yeah, you might have been going through it, you know what I'm saying, I'm in middle school and high school, but once you get like to that early adulthood, it's going to it's gonna like come out you, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> it's going to really like start showing externally, you know, so yeah, it's, it's it, yeah, that was a rough time for me too, you know, so. Yeah, I, uh, I really, uh, I, I really valued my college experience just because it was a time where I could really understand uh, myself, you know, uh, you know, growing up in a, uh, a single parent household and just, you know, having that really kind of close relationship with your mother, you know, having that, that independent time to kind of process everything to kind of have that independent time to, of reflection and to have that space to, to really grow in a, uh, in an uncontained environment. Uh, it was really beneficial for my trajectory as a man. And that's the reason why I encourage students to go away from their home. Because sometimes when you don't know yourself outside of, of the home, outside of where you're most comfortable at, like that's stifling to growth. And I feel like you need to have those foundational experience of, of flying on your own, you know, knowing what it's like to uh, have your wings clipped and to learn how to grow new wings. Um, and you know, to be able to fend for yourself and to mm. be able to understand what your own strength looks like without necessarily a, uh, um, you know, uh, a parachute. Yeah. So, yeah, no, um, I, I think that's the reason why I push college um, because, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're going to learn some stuff, but honestly, it's, uh, it, it gives you, it gives you your wings. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so you, you mentioned about, you know, what well, we both mentioned about, as black men, you know what I'm saying, we, we don't really, well, I, shit, the, I feel like the black community, we're doing better as, you know, like, as far as, like, you know, addressing the stigma of, you know, like being vulnerable and stuff. But what do you think has been, you know, the issue, like, you know what I'm saying, why have, you know, historically, have we not been able to, like, you know, just be, you know, like, just be able to say, hey, man, I, I'm hurt right now, you know what I'm saying, or, you know, like, man, I'm just not feeling, you know, like, I'm feeling sad right now, you know, I'm down right now, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, like, why do we always have to feel like that everything was okay, or we was always up, you know what I'm saying? Um, I would say, you know, uh, it's, we had to, uh, you know, shake a lot of things off as a result of slavery to keep a kind of a good face, to keep a resilient face on. Um, you know, helping each other out just even on a, you know, a safety level. Sometimes that can put our own selves in danger. And when you think about like such things as the the no snitching thing, mm -hmm. uh, I always look at the 12 years of slave uh, scene where they he saw the brother hanging but couldn't necessarily save him. And if you think about that on, on micro levels, such as, you know, just being there for brothers when they're hurting, it's like, all right, man, shake that off, man. You'll be all right. And, you know, that pervasive attitude, I believe, from slavery and maybe it has has origins back to our, our history and just Africa in general, which I'm not necessarily uh, sure of. But just that that machismo um, and that that pervading thought that uh, you can't talk about um, what's wrong with you. I think it's uh, it's a toxicity that exists in our community where you can't speak about what's going on wrong in your house or what, what happens in his house stays in his house or, mm -hmm. you know, what I say goes, or, you know, you just kind of keep that on the low. Um, it allows uh, children to be neglected. It allows children to be abused. Um, and it keeps, uh, it keeps the silence of those affected um, in silence and it keeps them in pain. And um, honestly, I don't, um, sometimes feel like we some of us have the tools to kind of really hold space for each other and understand what that really means and all of us have these feelings because when we get married when we get in relationships uh and when we enter certain spaces um the little kid in us is speaking uh whether or not we choose to acknowledge it or not yeah. and uh honestly it's uh i feel like it's something that's coming out of uh, it's coming out of our communities and I see a lot more people going to therapy. I see a lot more people acknowledging uh, their past. Um, and, you know, there's been some 
reconciliation, but we, we still got a long way to go. But, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's just not something that um, it just culturally, I don't know. It exists in our community. Uh, I took a, a class last semester. It exists in the Asian community as well. It exists in a lot of minority communities. Mm-hmm. Um, this whole idea of, you know, to the rest of the world, like, yo, you got to be, you know, strong, black and, you know, fearless and bold all the time. Yeah. And I think it's a protective thing from society. Um, you know, race definitely has a, a big part of that because, you know, you always want to seem like uh, all American black person to the rest of the world, you know, to get that job, uh, to get in this circle. You show any signs of weakness, you know, your whole uh your, your your employment could get, t- get taken away. You don't want to be too aggressive in meetings or, at, or, assert, or assert yourself because, you know, your job might get taken away, your your employment, whatever whatever that may be, it's, it's a protective thing. So in one way, I can understand why we do it, but also, um, you know, we still have some systems in place, uh, mm-hmm. specifically with parenting that, uh, you know, doesn't allow for uh, safe spaces to be had. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's that's real. I know um, I still struggle with that, you know what I'm saying, it's just to be completely honest. Um, even though I know better and I know that, you know, it's good to just be honest and in the, in the kind of, you know, share what, you, what you're going through with your people if you need to. But I still I still struggle with that. I, I want to say a few weeks ago, my people were trying to get me to go out and do something. And I just wasn't in the space to do it. And they kept pressuring me to come. I was trying to play it off cool. Like, no, nah, I'm cool. I'm going to stay home and... You know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a just relax. And they kept like, no, nah, maybe did you do this? And I was like, man, all right, <laughs> here's what's happening. <laughs> I'm not really in the space to be, you know, what I'm saying chummy with nobody or explaining it, it whatever was going on. I just don't want to do it. And but I think my issue is that, you know, because when I, I don't really talk to a lot of people who, who are, you know, like trauma informed. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So like not not say that not saying that their intentions are bad, but I come into a space like, you know, like um everything doesn't need a solution right there. You know? Yeah. And I feel like, you know, when I say things, I feel like a lot of people that I talk to want to solve it for me. You know what I'm saying? And I get that way too. So I mean I I, I take some of the blame, but 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 I feel like, you know, in our society, we always got this like quick, like, you know, like, Hey, let's fix it right now. But it's like, you know, because if I went to therapy like that and I tried to approach, um, you know, like a client and I try to heal all their trauma of 16 years in one, the first session, Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a cause more harm than good, you know, but a lot of people, you know, they're not trained to think like I'm like, I think so. But I I feel like that's my main barrier of like being honest with my feelings. Cause Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people want to like, keep digging and I, I just don't and a lot of times I just don't want to do that you know what I'm saying yeah and you know it's uh you do have to pick and choose your spot because as a, a natural uh empathic person um I, I would consider myself I'm always considering uh the lens of other people and I'm considering the impact but but as it relates to things that you're talking about let's just say I try to gauge whether or not the person for, for my particular self because I've been in a situation like you're not really feeling like going to a place you want to keep it all the way a buck but you just know like you just have to pick and choose your spots because like like you, people end up pissing you off because like you tell somebody like yo I'm not in this space and while if you told me that shit like I could probably understand it you tell yeah. them, them it coming from you and like when you're that person that's usually the the lift me upper person or yeah. the, the whole <laughs> person is different um so no you gotta you gotta gauge you gotta gauge whether or not the people around you are are capable of even understanding that message but truthfully it's always about being kind to yourself man taking really good self-care man because uh you gotta do what's best for you and i've learned in this life man you you're gonna piss a few people off doing what's best for you and those can be mm-hmm. people close to you those can be people that are not even close to you but man just uh keep really being good to yourself and i think honestly uh i follow this uh you know as everybody else does nowadays i follow some really good mental health uh, uh social media profiles mm-hmm. um i believe uh liz listens uh she really talks about this thing called reparenting yourself and just mm. learning new behaviors and learning and affirming what you're feeling without the validation of others. 
Um, Cause sometimes like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, validation and all of that. But yeah. like, yep, yep. hopefully man, uh, the biggest person that needs to be validated is you. And uh, my teacher said it best. He was just like, when I'm working with clients, he was just like, I always remember this. Everybody gets to be okay in the room. And I take that in every space, whether or not I'm talking to a client, whether I'm talking to my wife, whether I'm talking to my students, uh, whether I'm talking to family members, everybody gets to be okay in the room. Mm. Um, and yeah. whatever that means for that situation, that's what it means. But everybody gets to be okay in the room. Yeah. Shit, I like that. <laughs> You know, and I I feel like just by nature, I'm like a person who don't want to make nobody upset, you know, but I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm getting to a point where it's like, I'm going to have to, like, if I got to make some moves, then somebody going to be in their feelings. And because yeah. like, you know, like you think of, so like you think of like you have clients, right? And you might have yes. clients in an, org- in, in, in an agency where you might have to leave the agency, right? Mm-hmm. And you never want to like make sure you never want to like re-traumatize the client, you know what I'm saying? But in this world, you know what I'm saying, I also have like people to provide for. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, I I, I got to really choose them or anybody, you know, we we have to choose to, you know, say to make sure that the people we provide for are okay. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? You know, before anybody else is okay, you know what I'm saying? Like my mom, cuz my mom's a social worker, and she always says like, you know, like if if you can't give nothing, then there ain't really no reason for you to even be seeing no clients. Right. You know, if if you don't eat, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, so actually that's a good topic. How do you feel about, you know what I'm saying, you being a mental health provider, you know, how do you feel like when you're going through it and you got to get up and like, you know, put on the face to go see these kids, you know, so how does that, how... How do you power through that? Wow. So when I am not in a good space and I have to talk to clients, I'll put it to you like this. Mm -hmm. They're definitely leading group that day. Uh, I work with kids. So some, I mean, honestly, uh, I have, I probably have done such a great work with them uh, prior to that session that they're able to lift me up that day. Mm. So uh, I work inside of a school setting with my, my nonprofit. So, you know, honestly, I let them be my therapy. Uh, you know, kids have a way of teaching you something. I'm trying to give you a story. Uh, well, I wish I was really prepared for that. Like, it's been a few times this school year. Like, I just was not feeling it. And, yeah. you know, just letting them just kind of be them. Because uh, sometimes part of uh, a part of therapy and part of just group therapy is just uh, rolling with the resistance, rolling with whatever the client brings you that day. Uh, cause you know, some days you do have a topic some days, you know, it is just like, I'm here, I'm holding space, what y'all got for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some, sometimes though that, that is the best therapy, just coming in there and letting what comes come. Um, and I, I always, I, I took a, a teaching model from my, my previous profession. You are always the best teacher in the room, regardless <laughs> of how prepared or prepared you are for that day. So, no, man, I let you, it's, it's really kind of hard, uh, especially, I, I remember my first day as a clinician, I had to call uh, DCFS, uh, shoot, I had to call SAD, the SAS hotline the first mm-hmm. day. So, and I was not in the best space probably about like three years ago. So, yeah, I mean, it it was I had to take ultimate self-care, brother. It was a lot of walks. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a lot of, you know, hey, yo, I'm gonna have to put the these case notes <laughs> on yeah. pause real quick. Um, you know what? Instead of like doing back to back sessions, like I'm gonna have to take like a 45 minute break. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a lot of, you know, hey, you know what? I might need to cancel for today just because, like, I'm just, like, not there. Yeah, um, but yeah man, self-care is the is the highest form of self-love, brother. And I've learned it through working in this profession, man, just because, you know, I, I don't think anybody does this type of work, teaching, social work, uh, therapy, if you're just in it just for a dollar sign, if you're just in it because you don't care. Yeah. Uh, you're in the heart profession, and it's not something that you can really hide because uh, relationships are the fundamental driving force behind all of the, uh, the careers I just named. And mm-hmm. uh, when you're not uh, vested in it with that, it shows in your work and it shows uh, in the rapport that you have uh, with your clients. And um, yeah, man, you got to take good care of yourself, man, because uh, how you you're you're never 
regardless of you being this non-objective therapist sitting back trying to be, you know, maintain this this stoic phase or, or whatever else that is, unconditional positive regard, behind that you're still always grappling with yourself as it relates to, to your client at that moment. So no, taking you gotta take good, good self care, whatever that looks like for you, man. But my self care routine, brother, like honestly, like I, I come home, I'll be on some Batman stuff, brother. Like right now, <laughs> I'm currently in my office, brother. Sometimes I turn off the light, um, and I just zone out and I watch YouTube videos of other people playing video games. It is the nerdiest <laughs> thing ever. But brother, I literally I just sit and zone out and watch people play Super Mario Maker, or I watch people play NBA 2K on stream, mm-hmm. and it's the most relaxing thing ever. I throw my sage oil. Um, and yeah, man, nice. um, I like to take walks. Uh, let me see music. Uh, you know, talk to my wife. Uh, to play with my cat who likes to bite all of my shit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, brother, you know, but no, self, self-care, self man, it's, 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 much, it's much needed in this profession, brother. <laughs> Definitely. I feel like, um, you know, like we say self-care, but we ain't really, you know what I'm saying, like how me and you just busted that down, you know what I'm saying, like we ain't really talking about it because like I just saw this, um, this, this um, article where, where like, uh, a manager at like a behavioral health clinic committed suicide. You know what I'm mm. saying? And I'm thinking like, you know, that's a good question. Or this is a, a good time to like, you know, something like just something to think about. It's like, you know, say who's who who is take care who is taking care of us? You know what I'm saying? And and you know what I'm saying, yeah, we have self care and you know, a lot of social workers do have therapy, you know what I'm saying? But if you're not in the if you're not in that position to kind of, you know, have a therapist or, mm-hmm. you know, are you just not really self aware you can get lost in the shuffle and be like the you know saying that dude you know saying who who was you know he was the head of a behavioral health clinic and he committed suicide you know so this you know I, I would just like for for people to have, to have more of those conversations like you know, you know saying like I know we have a lot of you know especially like I mean like I, I have some clients and they have coordinators and case managers and they always want something that's like man like shit y'all y'all <laughs> Y'all just gotta, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's just a lot, you know? So, you know, mm-hmm. just something. I mean, I didn't mean to throw you off with that question, but it was just, it, it popped oh, up. I mean, <laughs> I think it's necessary. Like, who does take care of the people that take care of other people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you <laughs> and, know. And for me, man, um, that's, a, that's a whole sea of people. Like, I got, I got different friends for different reasons. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, some, you know, I'll tell like the whole world to some, I might tell, you know, I might, I might give, might give you a little bit of this, but you gotta, you gotta find your, you gotta find who your village is um, and use them brother. Uh, Cause yeah. me, I know sometimes I'll hold a lot of stuff in um, and I'll, I'll sit there. I'll kind of sit there, overthink it and I'll overthink it so, so much that I, I didn't put my own self in back into a, a depressive state. Mm. Um, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, you got to have your village, man. And you got to have your tools to kind of snap you out of that place, man. Because I think of social work is like being wearing a lot of different outfits for one show, bro. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I might step out of the client space, uh, you know, in a one on one session. And then I got to go into a group space and be an entirely different thing. Then I got to come back in the office and do this. And then you got to, you know, you get off work. You got to be a husband. You got to be, mm-hmm. you got to be a friend. Uh, you got to be a, you got to be a son, whatever that looks like. And uh, I feel like social work is a, uh, it's a lifestyle because while it, it does lead to a profession, I think this, the type of people that are in social work, they're, they're empathic. They're, they're in tune. Yeah. Uh, they're, Definitely. They're thinker. They are healers, uh, and I feel like your work never usually stops. I feel like I am my work in the sense that I embody a set of values. I embody a set of characteristics that pervade all areas of my life. Uh, I happen to get paid for that skill set in certain spaces, but I feel like just being a social worker, uh, it is, uh, it's a lifestyle. It's yeah. a lifestyle. Definitely, yeah. definitely, because people are gonna look at you like you got, you know, you you got some answers for them, you know. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I remember earlier this year, you know, what I'm saying uh, on Facebook we connected, 
And I remember, um, you know, I was talking about you know, the struggle I was having being laid off of my job, trying to yeah. figure out what I'm doing next. I'm still really in that transition, you know what I'm saying? But I'm just trying to stay busy right now. I haven't really sat down. I think I have an idea of what I'm going to oh. do, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in the in the tuck. But uh, but I remember you made the comment saying that you was in the same position I was in, and that was one of the best things you know what I'm saying, um, that happened because you was able to put more work into your nonprofit. Now your nonprofit is really taking off, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. you want to kind of uh, tell that story, you know what I'm saying, with a little more um, elaboration? Absolutely. So um, in 2016, when I first got the commission job, uh, I was unemployed prior to that. Um, I was getting unemployment, like prior to getting a job in 2016. And I was commissioned probably for about like, I will say like probably about like, about like five, six months or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that, uh, I turned down like several gigs, man, just because like I was in such a bad space, just like mentally, like, man, like I was a teacher and I had to call these people like the day before school started, man, just because like, bro, like I couldn't stand in front of no kids, man. Like, honestly, like I just couldn't do it. Like I was trying to search deep within inside myself, bro. But like I was hella depressed and like, I had to call these folks and like, and like, you know, relationships to everything in this field. So mm-hmm. I was risking, you know, my future relationships. I didn't have no fucking bread. Um, but I just kept telling myself, man, you know what? That was a reason why you're in this position now in life. And I knew I couldn't go backwards. Like I could go, I could go in one way you can look at it as a front was well, I could have went back to teaching and, and made some money. Yeah. Um, and it provided me some st- a stable form of living. Um, and, uh, but it was backwards because every year, like I talked for like three years at the end of every school year, I really wanted to quit and like go start my own thing. When mm-hmm. I thought about, you know, all those urges that I had, man. And I used to see like my peers that had went off to like start their own ventures. Uh, when I started really thinking about what the Made Man Foundation could be like. I knew I was not ready at certain points in my life, but I really felt like uh, I was being pushed in that direction. And whether I liked it or not, I had to start acknowledging in in my life, what did Dante want to do? Yeah. Um, uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine, she told me, uh, she told me, she's like, yo, do what you love. Um, and somebody else told me, I forgot, it was one friend of mine. It was like, yo, Dante, go do what the fuck you want to do. And honestly, I started putting together uh, just a, a plan of action. I started writing more. So then I started writing for blackdoctor.org. And I, um, yeah, man, I, I started getting paid off my writing a little bit more. So that was putting bread, um, you know, on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, after that, let me see. Uh, I, I had some, I had, I had I just got like a credit increase uh, or a balance increase on my credit card. So I took that balance increase. And I put my um, my LLC paperwork from LegalZoom on my credit card. And I just took a bet on myself with the Made Man Foundation. So I got the paperwork established. And I really live by the quote, man, if you put something down in writing and then you put the work for it after that and you keep on kind of speaking into existence, brother, like I really feel like things manifest. When I think about everything that's manifested in my life, I wrote it down. I kept on manifesting it and I kept on putting the work in. Mm. And you know what? I, uh, I read books like the alchemist around that time. And I used to, uh, weekly, I used to look at that Steve Harvey, YouTube clip jump. And he talks about, um, you know, when you jump and you jump off the cliff, pretty much, you know, you're going to hit a few rocks. You're going to get bloody. It's going to seem dark. It's going to seem like it's not working, but eventually your wings going to have to start working. Yeah, And around that time, it was a lot of life shit happening for me, man. It was just like just relationships were being disrupted. Um, You know, certain uh, patterns within myself were being disrupted. I started going to therapy and started really addressing some deep traumatic shit. Um, And shoot, man, I took I took some I took some I took some jobs. So I ended up getting like this really nice writing job. Um, they held me down for like a year while I was still creating Made Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
Uh, so one day, like I was taking one of these uh, midday depression naps while I was in the barbershop, ended up getting a really a pretty good job. And I started the mentoring program there because I had met the lady uh, who put me in contact with that job, created the mentoring program there. Yeah. She met my wife while I was there. Mm. But honestly, man, it was a lot of, man, it was a lot of dark moments, dude, because I'm honestly, I really, now that I'm thinking back at it, man, I have not really been... I have not really missed the, I have not missed the meal um, in, since 2016. And it was some stretches where, yo, bro, I just did not have a gig. Yeah. Um, but honestly, it was just, I kept believing in myself. And uh, so, bro, like I just had to use, I just had to use my network, man. So mm. that didn't happen in my family. Life shit just didn't stop happening. Yeah. Um, and every day, it was just like I had to keep on fighting for that because truthfully, man, like I, I don't like working for motherfuckers, to be really honest with you and transparent. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you on that one. I'm going to keep that a buck with you. Like, I mean, people funny acting as hell. You say one wrong thing to them, they'll take away, they'll take away your whole life existence. Um, I yeah. like to wake up when I like to wake up. I like to dress how I like to dress. I like to eat what I like to eat. And honestly, like I, when I not honestly, man, like when I listen to that, the intro to the Ice Cream Man CD, I really, I really live by that, brother. Like when P, Master P used to drop records every week, I knew that brother was living out his best life, brother. I was like, that dude is really doing what the fuck he want to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, and what's the purpose of his life if you don't do what the fuck you want to do, bro? That's real. And, Man, I fight for that every day. Um, it requires me to spend long hours. Um, like before you called, man, I was doing some work. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, man, nah, it's uh, it's 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 a battle, brother. But I, I battle for independence, yeah. and I just reason why I admire people like the Dame Dashes of the world, the Tony Drapers, um, anybody that's uh, black out there, independent, um, trying to go get it. Um, I I. I I salute everybody doing that, man. But it, it, it was dark, brother. And sometimes it's still dark, man, because like, you know, you, you're, you're your own marketer. You're your own. You got to you got to motivate yourself every day. You know, if you don't work, if you don't work one day, it puts more pressure on you to do the work the next day. So you kind of got to got to got to you have to guide yourself. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, nah, man, it's uh, but it's, it's it's the best decision I ever made betting on myself, brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can fully say, man, yeah, man, we've been a 1099 employee since 10, 10, uh, 2016. Mm. Man, that's inspiring, brother, to hear to hear that, you know what I'm saying? To really to really hear it, you know, because, yeah, because a lot of people don't tell you they, you know what I'm saying, they struggles and they, you know what I'm saying? But, I mean, they, you know, of course they want to show you the, you know, you know, yeah, I made it, mm -hmm. but you know what I'm saying? But I feel like I feel like this era is important now because now you see like grassroots shit, you know. So like like you see it, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like there's people yeah. there's people who's been following hip hop social workers since day one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And if you're still following it, you know you see that I'm still no matter how bad I might feel, no matter how great I might feel, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I don't always like recording shit, you know what I'm saying? But or I'll, or I'll, I don't always like posting every day, you know what I'm saying? But you can see the growth, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like that's just important just to show, to show, you know, just like you said, it's going to be some dark moments, you know what I'm saying? But you got to persevere and you find your independence, you know? I haven't, yeah. I haven't took that 100% leap yet, but everything that I'm doing is for that, you know what I'm saying? Because like you said, I hate I hate the politics. I hate I hate everything about, you know what I'm saying, working for someone. You know what I'm saying? Like I just don't like it. You know, I don't like the fact that you can really hold my that you can hold my livelihood, you know what I'm saying, with with your signature. <laughs> True. You know. Hey. But don't get it twisted, brother. Like, I mean, in between that, like, I have taken, like, some jobs. You know oh, what yeah, I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to do that. I entered, but I entered my employment situations more so it's that they, that they work for me, bro. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> I try to get strategic jobs mm -hmm. that, like, let me test out my ideas um, yeah. so that like, I didn't fuck up my own shit when I went to do my yeah. own shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it just worked out, man. And uh, you know that whole paradigm switch from you being a—I uh, uh, I forgot they used it. I, I, it was some. It was something with they. It's some kind of language that they have in contracts where you are. A, it's not a non-exempt employee, but like pretty much, it's like it's a some type of employee that they make you to where. 
pretty much like, yo, we can fire you at the will. You're an at will employee. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So when I read that actual language in my teaching contract that I was an at will employee and what that actually meant, I started treating employees like, yo, brother, you're at my will. Uh, because, mm-hmm. brother, like, employers make decisions based on what's best for them. Why shouldn't employees make decisions that's best for them? Because, like, people want to shame you when you quit jobs. Yeah. Uh, like, how we, we, like, honestly, like, and I'm kind of guilty of it. Like, if you think about basketball, like, we shame people like LeBron, Kevin Durant for making decisions that's best for them. But honestly speaking, like, yeah, I mean, they did what's best for them. And sometimes what's best for you individually ain't best for what's everybody else. But truthfully, yeah. you, at, the, at the end of the day, man, when it's all said and done, man, ain't nobody else's name on that check besides yours. That's real. Um, and true, you, you got to go home with yourself and you got to live with yourself, man. So while I'm on this earth, man, I, I got to do what's best for me. I got to go get it because I know the mission I'm about to go, I'm, I'm trying to serve. It's benefiting mm-hmm. other people. And um, if it's and that's benefiting uh, people under the spectrum of this W-2 job or if it's benefiting, um, you know, people underneath this 1099, we're going gonna, we gonna to do what's best for Dante Henderson. Yep, that's 100 percent. I feel that. Um, I mean, it's about it's about being strategic, man. And I had to open up that phone book too, man. Uh, like we have so much uh, a wealth of social capital that exists uh, with inside of our phone books, man. And we need to really use those things, man. As yeah. college educated uh, black men, um, and as people who are, uh, you know, have who have a, a wealth of support, man. People want to support you, man. So I, I had to start digging into to, to that phone book too, man. Because you know, when I start really telling people what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, I had a whole bunch of people standing behind me that have really even helped me get to this point. So while, you know, I, I might be an entrepreneur, um, I do have a, a whole team of people that are, are really supporting and backing me. Um, so, man, it, you know, shout out to those people, my board of directors, Tamika, Candice, uh, Bernice, um, and, you know, I, I Chicago Child Care Society. Like, I got a, a, a sea of people that are my advocates and that are my team, man. And um, I would just encourage you, brother, just as you're transitioning, man, just uh, do what you do what you need to do in order to do what you want to do, man. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever, whatever that is, brother, because, like, I feel like one of my mentors told me uh, he saw I had a blockage inside of me and it was uh, blocking me from greatness, it was blocking me from really, truly knowing who I was in this in the spectrum of the universe. He told me deep down, you already know. And when he said it, he was just like, Dante, there is never a moment in time when you don't know. Deep down, you already know what you need to do. It's just about you doing it. Yeah. Do you want that responsibility? Do you want um, do you want what comes with that? Are you ready to receive that? And deep down, you already know your answers. Stop bullshitting with yourself and other people and saying that you don't know. You know. Mm. Damn. That's some real shit. I, I, I appreciate that, brother. Like, for real. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I'm not even, yeah, that's, you know, because, yeah. My, yeah. yeah man. Yeah. Well, shit, man. Uh, before we get out of here, I'm curious to know how social work is in other areas so you know what I'm saying like so what's like what's like the social work landscape you know what I'm saying in the shot you know um I would say uh pretty pretty diverse uh we got a, a number of uh social service agencies uh you know we got a lot of uh, uh school social work uh that happens um, a lot of agencies that uh, support, uh, you know, battered women mm-hmm. uh, that do child care. So it's, it's, it's very diverse out here um, in terms of it being like a, a competitive thing. Like, yeah, it's kind of growing out here. Um, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of getting used to it like myself. Um, but uh, in the spaces that I've been involved in, it's, it's a lot of people that are out there doing uh, really good uh, youth advocacy work. Uh, one program, GT7 Chicago, uh, they work with uh, young black men. Um, they're doing some really good work. Um, I would say uh, they got the they got a few other male mentoring programs. But yeah, man, oh, it's uh, it's it's pretty diverse out here. You know, um, I would just say like I mean, it's just uh, you know anything that goes on like probably everywhere else just probably on a larger level because it's Chicago third largest city so you know mm-hmm. okay 
Yes, sir. Well, anything uh, you want to shout out before we uh, before we uh, go ahead and sign off? Yeah, yeah uh, you know, stay in tune with me. Um, I'm on uh, Instagram uh, as uh, Brother Henderson. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be putting some more updates on my uh, actual uh, social media page for my nonprofit, but we're the Made Man, we're Made Man Foundation on um, Instagram. Uh, if you have um, any kind of, uh, you want to contact me about my services, uh, you can reach me at Dante at MadeManFoundation.org. Uh, you spell my name, D-A-U-N-T-E, at MadeManFoundation.org. Um, and I just want you to, I want everybody to realize that there is gold within inside of us all. It is about mining that gold, and it is about, uh, you know, putting that blue magic inside of that, that really, that magical vial and selling it to the rest of the world. Um, and I just want everybody to go out there and do what they want to do, um, and do it, do it the best way and serve mankind. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like a true social worker, (laughs) (laughs) man. Well, I appreciate you for connecting and, uh, man, uh, let's stay in touch. Cool. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you, brother. All right, fam. All right, peace. There you go.